À, tên tôi là Hiếu Châu I'm from Vietnam My husband passed away And then I feel You need to join With what? With what you join? Every shirt that The house of the Lord They say But I join the first shirt That my family Because I send my home My, my son over here That's why I really have feeling with here Really good Really friendly person over here Mi nombre es Giselle México A mí me gusta la comida mexicana es, Tiene los mejores tacos A, a la iglesia uh, Porque mi hermano me hizo que viniera A las personas My name is Ed McMillan I'm from Gastonia, North Carolina Of the United States of America Gastonia is known for Tony's ice cream. The milkshakes are probably the best in the world, I think. Uh, my wife and I were searching for a church. I came and fell in love with it. I love the love that's shown once you walk in the door. I mean, you can feel the presence of, of God and you can feel that, that people have a genuine love and that really attracted us also. I humble Priscilla Uguchi Okoro. I'm from Onya, Nigeria. Nigeria will be doing Marama, Jupiterana, Susu di Chiche, Namba di Chiche, Deco Gardena, Lizzie, anyway. And my children, Gakoka, when I'm much naked to Teraneba, I would ask you where Chopota First Church. Here, my ceremony, First Church, Edi Obuna, all Oka Jupiterana, Monsa Chineke, Nehonanya and Kitchineke. I told me, Nadi Johnny, in Jagana, here, West Africa. When here in West Africa, man here think he was independent in England, yeah, 1957. Uh, first church, uh, it was more we could be. Many of you think how many me she. My name is Sandra. I'm actually interpreting for American Sign Language for deaf people. Most people think that sign language is universal, worldly, and it's not. Every country has a different sign language. This is English. This is American sign language here. My favorite thing about First Church is the people here. I've enjoyed um, everyone I've met. Uh, when I first started, the only person I knew here at First Church was Lois, whose sign name is right here, Lois. And then I hadn't even met Pastor Nathan or Sister Charlotte at that time. So it was very interesting to start signing that first day you arrived in a church, you don't know anyone. But it's been awesome. Um, I meet new people daily, and I just enjoy everyone here. Me the Ajoa. I'm free Ghana. My favorite thing about First Church is since I'm a hostess, I get a chance to hug and kiss everybody. Not the younger ones, you know, the grandmas and the grandpas. I, they give me the kisses and the hugs and the love. I just love people, and it gets me excited every time I come to church. My name is Israel Viana. I'm from Brazil. When I first got in Charlotte, very nice old guy, uh, Ralph, he invited me to come to the church. Uh, então, uh, como eu ia dizendo, a, a razão que, pela qual me encanta de, de, de estar aqui na, na, na igreja, First Church, é o fato das pessoas serem tão receptivas, tão, tão, tão legais. Uh, é realmente uma benção estar aqui. Uh, eu gosto muito de todos, tenho um carinho muito grande por essa comunidade e gostaria muito de, de poder ficar aqui e continuar uh, rezando e, e tendo essa, essa comunhão com todos vocês. Muito obrigado. Bridget Samuel, de Jamaica, West Indies. My favorite thing about the country is the, the warmth of the people, the culture, our food. Yeah, so Brother Don Dixon and his family. Um, we're here and they told us about First Church and uh, we came and ever since then it was just loving it. First Church um, is very family oriented. Um, the presence of the Lord is here, the word is preached and I can feel the presence of God and that's one of the main things that keeps me, that's the glue that keeps me at First Church and the love of the people. My name is Sandra, uh, I represent Colombia. Primero, no Pablo Escobar, no guerrilla. Uh, nuestro país es un país con mucha variedad, bellas tradiciones, bellos valores, bella gente, eh, bellos paisajes. Es un bello país. Lo más favorito 
que tengo yo en la iglesia es que se puede sentir el amor de Dios y el amor a las personas.
East Africans, now we have our West Africans.
ministry team here at First Church than I am right now. We live in an hour where peoples are being torn apart through hatred. There is so much anger and hatred and tension in our world today that it can be astonishing sometimes to expose yourself to the river of negativity that comes through our media, comes through the social media platforms, it is a river of dissent and anger and rage. But look at God's people. And I just real quick, I want to speak for the whole ministry team here. I'm going to, to avail myself of this opportunity to speak for everyone from my dad and my mom to my wife team, our pastoral care team, uh, our worship pastor, our student pastor. I want to tell all of you the honor is ours to serve you and worship with you and come together in this house and glorify God. There's not a person, there's not a person from the eldest to the youngest in our ministry team that can do this. This is a God thing. Of God. And so I know it's super crowded, but I want us to do what is First Church tradition. I want us to do it. I know it's going to be a little bit crowded. I do not care. Uh, this is First Church tradition. And if you don't do this, well, you're going to miss something. So let's all stand. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to turn around and hug two or three people that it's mostly legal to hug. And I want you to greet one another in the name of the Lord. I want you to smile at somebody and say, you're probably a better Christian than I am. <laughs> Tell somebody, say, thank you for letting me be a part of a church like this. Maybe greet one or two more or one more or no more and head back to your seats. While you are returning to your seats, let me make you aware of a few things, uh, different ways that our church uh, serves and helps. Uh, of course, we, you know our Sunday schedule. We have a Bible study on Wednesday night at 7.30. We also have a mentoring ministry that serves the children in the neighborhoods around the church on Wednesday night. There is opportunity there to be a participant and a volunteer in both of those areas. Our church also has small groups that meet around the city. If you're looking for a place to connect, if you will make just a little bit of effort and let us know, then we can get you connected with other Christian community and it will make our church better if you join in and at some point I feel like our church will be a blessing to you hopefully as soon as possible um, also I want to say uh, if you're kind of new or visiting and you're interested in the church and you perhaps would like to know more I, I teach a small group that meets on Sunday after the, this service uh, it's not today because after the service we have taste of the nations across See, see, you see, you see, I could have said uh, the Lord loves you and I wouldn't have got that shout, but I mentioned food and it's like instant victory fills the whole house. My God, food. 
And so that's right across in the Life Center. Um, but uh, so the idea of this small group called First Steps is for us to get to know each other. Uh, if we become friends, two things are going to have to happen. First of all, uh, we're going to have to open our hearts to you. We're going to have to create a place. It's not in this Sunday service. This is one guy talking and several hundred listening. Um, we have to create a place where we can open our heart and our schedule um, and our stories and who we are, our personality to you. That has to happen. Secondly, you have to open your heart to us. It's not enough if we open our heart to you. You have to choose to come and open your heart to us. And so um, I invite those of you who have not uh, gone through First Steps yet, uh, when we get back on schedule for that, which will be coming up soon. We are in the middle of a, a session right now. Please make the time. Open your heart to us. The Lord will knit us together. And in that knitting is a testimony of Christian purpose and Christian ministry. In the knitting together, uh, I'm incomplete without you. And believe it or not, you're incomplete without me. And so the Lord knits us together. So uh, First Church is just a big family, and we are a church, and we uh, love you all in the Lord. And if you will let us get to know you, we'll just be able to say we love you, period. And we love you in the Lord. <laughs> so God bless you all. It is our honor and privilege to have... Uh, Brother Lance Stockman here with us today, ministering to us today. We chose him because he's not a long-winded preacher, and <laughs> that's funny. And uh, he has his he has his lovely uh, bride with him. I don't know what he did to get her to say yes, uh, but we're going to have him come teach a seminar to single men on how to get girls that are above your pay grade to say yes. <laughs> And um, so that's what's happening uh, later on. And all you single men, you need to be there with a uh, tape recorder. So, no, just having fun. Um, I, I respect my uh, Lance. Lance is my nephew. I call him Lance. Um, he, I respect his, his passion for the things of God. I respect his, his gift of faith and his gift of the word of faith. And so I want him to come and open his heart to us here for a few moments. Put your hands together and let's give him a first church welcome here. you came in this house this morning ready to receive something from the Lord, you ought to stand to your feet and give God a shout of praise in this house. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. I believe the Lord has showed up and God is going to do something great and supernatural in this house this morning. It is true if you look around you, this is what heaven's going to be like. And if it makes you uncomfortable, you might be in the wrong line of business. But this is what heaven's going to be like. We're going to shout together. We're going to get crazy together. We're going to be radical together. We're going to wear the same kind of robe together. I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen. I give honor today to your pastor, my family. Thank them for the invitation. I told the 9 o'clock service this morning, I told them that I have been waiting for the privilege and the opportunity to come to this all-nation service. I love it. I love it. So I give them honor and thank them for allowing me and my, yes, beautiful wife, who is way out of my league, with me today. The way that I got her was I saw enough ugly men with pretty women I knew if there was hope for them there was hope for me so I waited 31 years to get me a beautiful 24 year old and I got her amen amen I'll be reading from Genesis chapter 37 Genesis chapter 37 and we'll begin reading in verse 18 would you stand in honor of the word of God Genesis chapter 37, verse 18. And when you have it, say amen. And when they saw him afar off, talking about Joseph, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams 
And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass... When Joseph was coming to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in the pit. I want to talk to you from this subject this morning. There's miracles in this room. There's deliverance in this room. There will be some people that's going to leave here healed supernaturally. So I want to preach to you this morning from this subject. Reuben pushed you in, but Judah can get you out. Reuben put you in, but Judah can get you out. Would you close your Bibles and lift our hands to the heavens and open up our mouths and pray that God would move and work in a supernatural way. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come in this house and worship and praise that beautiful name of Jesus. We ask, God, that you would manifest yourself in this house with miracles and signs and wonders. Let hope come to those that are hopeless. Let healing come to those that need healing. Let restoration come to those that need it. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I bind every pain. I bind every spirit of sickness, every spirit of doubt and unbelief, and we release it. We release healing and deliverance and signs and wonders in this house. We worship your name, God, and we will come out of this pit. I said we will come out of this pit. Devil, we will win. We will be victorious. Praise God. If you believe that, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Praise God. If one could put a thousand to flight and ten, two put ten thousand, I believe we're going to put a lot of devils on the run this morning. I believe something's about to happen in the atmosphere this morning. As you're seated, nudge your neighbor, say, neighbor, it's time to get out of the pit. It's time to get out of the pit. Praise God. Praise God. When we read the story of Joseph, there are some things that the Word of God makes very clear. We know that Joseph was chosen by God. We know that Joseph was anointed by God. We know that he had a destiny that was given by God. He was favored by God. He was favored by his earthly father. And we know that the most important thing through his life is that God was with Joseph. It sounds like a winning combination. It would seem as though he was living the life that everyone else would dream of living. But I've learned that if you dream, there's going to be a price that you're going to have to pay. I've learned that if you serve God and if you want to be successful, there's going to be some struggles you're going to have to go through. Uh, you're going to have to go through some backbiting and some backstabbing and some negative reports. You're going to have to go through it. Uh, but when we read the Bible, we find out that this same Joseph who had everything going for him, who was anointed by God, favored by his earthly father, and had so many great advantages, one day found himself in a pit. I want to stop just for a moment and tell you something. If somebody told you that whenever you became a Christian, that all your problems would be over, they were mistaken. If they told you that you would never be hurt again, that you would never cry again, that you would never suffer again, that you would never be disappointed again, ladies and gentlemen, if they told you that, they lied. If you live for God, you will fight some battles. You will go through some hardships. You will face pain. But the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth him out of 
them all. I think of dreamers that has come and gone. I thought of the other day of the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who lived on a vision and he lost his life for a vision but because he sought a vision with a pure heart and he had his mind made up to fulfill a vision, to fulfill a dream, his dream still lives on today. I've come to tell somebody in this place this morning that God is still a deliverer. He's still a way maker. He's still a provider. He's still a healer. He's still a door opener. He's still a comforter in your darkest hour. You ought to tell somebody around you, I still believe it. I may be hurting, but I believe God. I may be lied on and mistreated. Heart has been broken, shed a lot of tears. I may not always get what I wanted when I wanted to get it, but I still believe that God is able to pull through for me. The point I'm trying to make is that Christians still have problems. We get sick. We get in debt. We have relationships that fall apart. We get our heart broken. I've had my heart broken many times before I finally found her. We get in places we shouldn't be. Christians get addicted to prescription drugs. We have trouble too. But I'm glad today to make a declaration that I know the master of the wind. I know the maker of the rain. I know the calmer of the storm. I know the healer and my sick room. Can I get old school for a little bit? I know the reason why I dance and praise him. I know the reason why I get loud and radical. Because I serve a God that if he did it before, he could do it now. I serve a God, the same God that brought Joseph out of the pit, the same God that healed mom and daddy could heal you this morning. He's just waiting on some men and women to realize that I've got to get out of this pit. Praise God. If you believe it, shout one more time. A pit is funny. Sometimes you fall in the pit. Sometimes you jump in the pit. Sometimes people push you in a pit. But regardless of how you get there or why you got there, a pit is a pit. And there's one thing I could assure you that if you stay in your pit, if you stay in your dilemma, if you stay in doubt and in fear, you're going to die. If you stay in the pit where there's no joy, where there's no hope, where the water of your pit is drying up and there's no other resources to lean on, if you decide to stay there, you will die there. But whenever you have your mind made up to get out of the pit, look out, devil. When you have your mind made up to get out of the pit, look out because my family's coming out of the pit. My ministry will not die in the pit. I know the doctor said you might have cancer, but I know a God who will send a ladder down in your pit, who will bring you out of your financial crisis, who will give you a new reason to shout and to bless him, but you've got to get your mind made up to give God the sacrifice of praise. We asked the question, why was Joseph thrown in the pit? It's because his brothers hated his dreams. How many people do you know lost their lives and failed and people tried to destroy them because they had a dream of being something that they wanted. They had a dream of coming out of their problems and their dilemma and reaching forward into something that they wanted to come out of. They hated him because of his dream. Let me tell you something. The, the enemy hates you because of your dream. He hates your plans. He hates your passion. He hates your God-given purpose. He hates the fact that we're all together in one mind and one accord, worshiping and praising the one true God. He hates it. He hates it. And the devil is always trying to find a weak individual. He's always trying to find the right point and the right opportunity to try to push someone over in the pit and bring others in the pit with them. But I want you to hear this preacher this morning. Don't stop dreaming. Don't stop shouting. Don't stop worshiping. Don't stop praying. Don't stop being faithful. Don't stop 
believing. You ought to tell somebody near you, say, I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep going forward. I'm going to keep shouting. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep speaking in faith. For we walk by faith and not by sight. I'm going to come out of this thing. There are some people who saw you in a pit. There are some people that even helped put you in the pit. And they have watched you struggling and pushing and scratching and clawing, trying to climb your way out. When they left you, you were in the pit. The last time they saw you, you were in the pit. You were a mess. But I came this morning in the prophetic to tell you right now that you're about to come out. I'm not just preaching, I'm prophesying this morning. I'm declaring to you with prophetic unction and authority that you're coming out. I wish somebody would prophesy and say, I'm coming out. I'm worn and weary, I'm hurt and wounded, but I'm, dis I'm disappointed and disgusted, but I will come out of this pit. I don't know what the pit is for you today. It may be debt, it may be sickness, it may be bondage or addiction, despair, depression, anger, bitterness, marriage problems, and it looks so deep that you can't get your way out, but I hear a Judah coming on your behalf. Oh, I don't know what your pit is today. They come in all different shapes and sizes. I don't know what it is for you, but I want you to look at your neighbor and prophesy to them and tell them I've spent my last night in the pit. Sorrow, shame, worry, anxiety, sadness. The Bible says weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. There's something about coming to the house of God and getting taking advantage of this service, going home and looking forward to the morning. You know that old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new when you get in his presence. I'm telling you something's about to happen in this place. Reuben came back to the pit where he last saw Joseph. And Joseph wasn't there. There are some people, they thought they knew you pretty good. They thought they knew where to look for you. They even talked about your pitiful condition to other people. But that was yesterday. Yesterday I was in the pit. Yesterday I looked like I was going to die in the pit. Yesterday I felt like I was going to die in the pit. But in the pit I could hear the voice of Joseph. I could hear Joseph say, don't die in the pit. The fall doesn't have to be fatal. Don't quit dreaming. Don't quit believing. Don't quit trusting. Don't quit expecting. It looked like Joseph was going to die in the pit. It even felt like he was going to die in the pit, but through a turn of circumstances and a matter of minutes, Joseph was up out of the pit on solid ground. I came to tell some people this morning that God is going to turn it around. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he's going to do it or who he may do it through. But I just came to tell you this morning that God is a God of the turnaround, like he did with Joseph, like he did with Job, like he did with Daniel, like he did with the three Hebrew children from Jonah to Jesus himself. From Genesis to Revelation, God is turning it around. And if you haven't been convinced yet, all you have to do is look in the mirror. I said, all you have to do is wake up and look in the mirror. Some of you used to be pushers. Some of you used to be thieves and liars, adulterers, fornicators, alcoholics, drug addicts, and everything else under the sun, moon, and stars. But that was B.C. That was before Christ. I'm telling you, it's time to leave your past behind you. It's time to leave your failures and mistakes behind you. It's time to look for the future. It's time to take advantage of the moment right now. And they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah, the other brother, said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. 
And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. It was Judah that got him out of the pit. And if I want to bring you back just for a little bit, a a moment, what Judah means is Judah means praise. It wasn't his coat of many colors that got him out of the pit. It wasn't his anointing that got him out of the pit. It wasn't his dreams that got him out of the pit. It was ugly old Judah that got him out. Reuben got him in, but Judah got him out. I don't care how you got there. I don't care who it was that put you there. I came this morning to remind you that your praise will get you out of your pit. The circumstances may not have been Joseph's choosing. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, Judah was responsible for getting him out of the pit. Mean, old, ugly, Judah got him out. The point I'm trying to make is is that praise doesn't have to be pretty to be powerful. After many years of the ark of God being absent from Israel, David the king finally brings it home. The ark symbolizing the presence, the guidance, the protection, the favor of God to his people. David was so excited about bringing the ark back that the Bible says he danced before the Lord with all of his might. He danced right out of his kingly apparel. Michael, David's wife, saw him dancing and despised him in her heart. His praise embarrassed her. It embarrassed her. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. What she was saying was that was shameful. That was embarrassing. That was ugly. That was humiliating. David could have said, you're right, honey. That was no way for a king to act. I should have composed myself. I should have behaved myself. I'm sorry that I embarrassed you, but he didn't. I'm paraphrasing this morning, but what David said was, if you thought that was embarrassing, and if you thought that was shameful, and if you thought that was ugly, you haven't seen anything Yet, what David was saying was, if you didn't like my last praise, you thought the last praise was over the top, you thought my last praise was embarrassing, you thought my last praise was ugly, you haven't seen anything yet. I wish somebody today would quit worrying about what everybody else thinks about you. Quit worrying about getting it all together, looking just right, feeling just right. Quit waiting for the battle to be over, baby. God's waiting on you to praise him right now. Isaiah said what you ought to do for the spirit of heaviness is put on a garment of praise. Sometimes I've got to reach back in my closet and get that old garment out. Sometimes I got to remember where the Lord brought me from and get a dance in my feet sometimes. Get a clapping in my hand sometimes. Let it come from here. Quit waiting on the right opportunity. It's now. Quit waiting on things to get perfect in your life. Take advantage of the moment and praise your way out now. Your miracles in your praise. Your breakthroughs in your praise. Revival in your homes in your praise. Your answers in your praise. My God, don't keep your dream quiet. Don't keep your word from the Lord quiet. I don't care how deep your pit is, you ought to shout anyway. The deeper you get in the pit, the higher your praise ought to be. The deeper you get in the pit, the more you ought to open up your mouth and give God a praise. There was a lady, I love to tell this story. There was a lady in our church back home in Louisiana. She didn't have much. She didn't come from much at all. Didn't have a car to her name that I knew of at the time. Didn't have a good job. Nothing like that. But when she came to the house of God, she came broken. She came in a pit. Sometimes God allows us to get in a pit so we know how to reach for him. Sometimes God allows us to fall deep so we understand the true meaning of Judah. 
of praise. You see, a lot of people, they, they, they're scared of praise. They're scared of it. They, they don't know how to respond to it. And then people make them nervous if they get a little bit out of control sometimes. But this woman, she came in the house of God and she didn't have anything. And all of a sudden she felt the presence of God and God filled her with the Holy Ghost and she began to worship and she began to praise God every day from that day forward. And finally somebody in the church, you know, there's always going to be somebody a little too dignified to praise him. You know, they just, uh, they don't, don't mess my hair up. Don't, don't mess my shoes up. Don't mess my dress up. Don't, you, you got to get past that sometimes. You've got to get in the spirit sometimes. And so all of a sudden this, this other lady in the church kept on Esther, why do you have to praise God like you do? Why do you have to always get loud above everybody else like you do? And she simply said, honey, if you knew where the Lord brought me from, if you knew the lifestyle that I lived and what I went through, the times that I was sick in my body, I didn't have a roof over my head, I didn't have a card of my name, but I found praise when I found Jesus. And I've learned the louder I get, the more God, uh, more of God's attention that I get. The more I praise God, the more he blesses me. So you have to excuse me every time I drive by the church. I have to pull over because my hands get going. My feet get to moving. Do you know what it is? It was somebody who had a revelation of the power of Judah and what Judah could do for her, Judah could do for you. Quit waiting on God. Baby, God is waiting on you to rise up. And to say, I may not have anything left. The water may be dried up in the pit, but I have Judah to depend on. I have never... Let me tell you something. God has blessed me with seeing some of the greatest miracles I have ever witnessed before in my life. I have seen people throw away walking canes and people who wasn't able to use a leg, use a leg. People who was crippled, able to walk. People who was dying with cancer, be healed instantly. I was telling a story this morning about a woman who's uh, had an organ transplant, a kidney transplant, and the doctor said that the body was not responding to the kidney. But all of a sudden, she worshiped and praised God and leaned on God for her miracle, and God instantly turned that situation around, and the body started taking to the kidney. What I'm telling you is this, is every miracle that I have seen God do, that's why I speak it so passionate. That's why I get loud. You have to excuse me. That's why I get a little bit excited because whenever I start talking about what God can do, not only what he has done, but what he can do. When, when I think about the pit that I have seen people in and them come out of that pit, there is something that burns on the inside of my belly that I just can't contain. It's like the prophet said. It's like fire shut up in my bones. I just get excited. There, there is something about People, when they receive their miracle, it doesn't happen by accident. Pastor made a good, a good point this morning. He said, God is a gentleman. God's not going to push himself on you. He's not. He's not going to make you be healed. He's not going to make you be delivered. He's not going to bring you out of the pit unless you want to be out of the pit. Every man and woman that I have seen God deliver, heal, or set free, it started with a praise. It started with desperation. It started with, a, and I don't care what people think about me. I don't care how people look at me. I don't care if they mock me, if they make fun of me. I've got my mind made up that I'm coming out of this pit. You can die in there if you want to. You can stay in there and cry if you want to. But I'm coming out. I win because God says I could win. I have a dream. I have a word from the Lord, and I'm not going to let it die in the pit. If you believe that, you ought to stand to your feet and shout unto God. <laughs> Musicians, go ahead and come on. I'm getting ready. When people get a word from the Lord, they want to keep it to themselves. When people hear from God and they need God to do something, they don't want to talk about it. 
But I believe in going ahead and pushing through the pride, pushing through the doubt, pushing through the naysayers, and opening up your mouth and speaking to the mountain. Speak to it in faith and watch it disappear. There were some of you in this place, you've been fighting things for too long. You've been trying to swim in your pit and hoping that the last drop of water would come down and save you, and it's not. It's not. The only thing that's going to save you, the only thing that's going to bring you out is your praise. The only thing that's going to bring you out is the hallelujah. The only thing that's going to bring you out is you getting outside of the box just a little bit, saying, God, I need you. I need you. If you said you'll do it, if you have given me a promise, Lord, I'm going to do all I can to receive that promise. But one way or another, I will not die in this pit. I will come out. I will come out. Can I ask you to be honest in this house? Can we be honest for a moment? Is there anybody in this place, you feel like you've just been in a pit. Maybe you need a miracle. Maybe you need God to do something in your life. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe it's a relationship situation. Maybe you have a family member that's strayed away from the truth and you know they're in a pit and you need to stand for them. But if you need God to do something for you, would you lift your hand right now and just be honest. Be honest in the house of God. It's all right. Nobody's here to judge. Nobody's here to condemn. It's just you and Jesus. It's between you and Him. Now the next step is is up to you. It's up to you. If you have your mind made up that you're going to win, that you are going to come out of your pit, if you feel comfortable grabbing somebody by the hand and asking them to come with you, that's fine. But what I want you to do, if you had your hand raised, I want you to come out of your pew and come stand around this altar right now. We want to pray for you. And every time you make a step, you ought to just say to yourself or to your neighbor, say, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm going to be healed in Jesus' name. I'm going to be delivered in Jesus' name. I will not die in this pit. Would you press your way in, church? There's plenty of room at the altar. Come forward. Come forward. There's plenty of room, plenty of room. Oh, God is able. He's able today. He's able. Come on, church, lift your hands to the heavens. Surrender to Him. Open up your mouth. He's walking by. He's walking by today. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, worship with us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road. For information about service times, church ministries, and so much more, visit us online at firstchurchclt.com. If you would like to support our efforts, text GIVE to 704-445-5353. We pray God's richest blessings to you. Come, worship with us.